King, and in the case of Mali, Nora Lecumberi. And Nora will be presenting the main findings today. Chloe Chang heads our operations team, which includes Quinn Higgins and in-country operation support from Mamadou Diara. Angelina Soriano, our product support specialist, is a one-woman force that handles our outward-facing products. My name is Stephen Brown, and I'm the chief of party of this task order. Next slide, please. At this time, I'm going to hand it over to our colleague, Phil Steffen, who will be providing some opening remarks. Over to you, Phil. Thanks, Stephen, and welcome everyone to this presentation. I'd, I'd like to say a few words about the task order, which made this work possible. This task order under FuseNet Pillar 3 will update the livelihood zone baseline profiles in six countries over three years. Today, we'll hear about the results in one of these year one countries, that's Mali. We were off to a late start in Mali because we had to change countries in year one due to concerns about election insecurity in two other countries. Nonetheless, the team got off, recovered ground quickly, quickly forged contacts and relations with local stakeholders, mobilized multiple teams to carry out the work. The team overcame implementation challenges by training over 70 Malians in household economy analysis, which you'll hear about. Most of these were from the local government. However, the team was supported by the familiarity of many other Malians with the household economy analysis approach. Our team had a successful conference to validate the results of preliminary research in November. This is in Sikasso. Also briefed the mission later in, in Bamako. Unfortunately, the team had to pause data collection in three of the livelihood zones, mostly in the far north, due to resurging conflict. After a pause, the Malian government's early warning system, the SAP, resumed data collection and finished all the work in December. These results were validated with the SAP with remote support. So today we're very happy to present the results of this uh, updating of the Malian Livelihood Zone baseline profiles. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Um, and thank you everyone again for joining us today. Um, next slide, please. Um, next slide, great, thank you. So now I would like to briefly go over FuseNet's pillar structure. I know that there are several colleagues on the call that are unfamiliar with uh, FuseNet's pillar structure. So I'd like to take a, a brief moment to go over it here. Uh, the FAM and Early Warning System Network or FuseNet is an integrated set of activities that is funded by USAID and it's intended to provide timely and relevant and evidence-driven analyses of current and future acute food insecurity in select countries. FuseNet's structure is divided across four pillars, which you see here on this slide. Pillar one, also known as the early warning team, provides timely, accurate, and transparent early warning of current and future acute food insecurity worldwide. Pillar two, FuseNet's learning and data hub, or simply the hub, ensures that FuseNet's data and analyses are captured, documented, and widely accessible for users through FuseNet's website and other delivery channels. Pillar three, or the analysis of the dynamics of food, nutrition, and livelihood security, this pillar aims to deepen the understanding of the causes of persistent or reoccurrent food insecurity, malnutrition, and vulnerability to food insecurity so that appropriate responses can be developed. This pillar will use and expand FuseNet's rich understanding of livelihoods, markets, agroclimatology, nutrition, and other socioeconomic phenomena to help identify solutions 
to sustainably enhance food, nutrition, and livelihood security, as well as build resilience. There are two task orders under this pillar three, and the presentation shown here today is for task order one, like the livelihoods team. Pillar four is a cross-cutting pillar that focuses on technological development and, and innovation. Next slide, please. Pillar three is first task order aims to update or develop, in some cases, household economy analysis, livelihood zone baselines. FuseNet uses household economy analysis or HEA livelihoods framework as the lens to interpret early warning information. I will get into what HEA is later on in the presentation, but in short, HEA examines household operations or how households across the wealth spectrum source food, income, and their expenditure patterns. It also looks at social relationships and how households are able to cope in the face of hazards. Once these livelihood zone baselines are developed, our early warning team colleagues from Pillar 1 will use the baselines to analyze acute and projected food insecurity within their, uh, their countries of operation. Access to accurate livelihood baseline profiles is critical for the early warning team's scenario development process. But it's also important for IPC and CARDRA harmonize analyses and for informing decision makers on efficient resource targeting. Additionally, by updating FuseNet's livelihoods knowledge base, this task order's research can support a range of other ongoing and ad hoc analyses, such as re resilience-based development planning, scalable safety nets design, and monitoring and evaluation. Next slide, please. As Bill mentioned, this task order is to be implemented over the course of three years, starting off with a base year and two subsequent option years. During each year, our team will complete HEA baselines in two countries per year. In addition to developing the livelihood zone baselines in Mali, our team also developed baselines in Northeast Nigeria. Right now, we are currently in our option or our first option year or year two, where we plan to develop national HEA baselines for Burundi and the DRC. Next year, depending on the execution of option year two, we'll produce HEA baselines for Guatemala and Zimbabwe. The scope of this task order is not limited to developing HEA baselines. We are also focused on strengthening the technical capacity of HEA. The field work under this task order offers opportunities where appropriate for FuseNet colleagues and partners to participate in the baseline data collection. And this will strengthen the practitioner's capacity to understand the baseline's data collection and analysis process and the results, and especially useful in IPC analyses. Upon completing the field work, team members should be able to confidently communicate livelihoods baseline information across forums and audiences. Also, since baselines serve as the foundation for outcome analysis, team members participating in baseline data collection will gain a deeper appreciation of the end-to-end -end process of the HEA analytical framework. Next slide, please. Now I'll go a little bit into FuseNet's livelihoods analysis. This is the household economy analysis. Since 2000, FuseNet has used HEA as the lens through which to view early warning information. FuseNet uses HEA to help organize and make operational the livelihoods related information needed for its acute food insecurity projections. Next slide. 
We have a seven minute animation on HEA, which can be found on the FuseNet's website. We can also drop the link in the chat so colleagues can view this video at their leisure. However, at this point, I'm going to quickly go through uh, the analytical framework. And this slide uh, provides a, a summary. As you can see here, the starting point of our analysis starts with the baselines. All baseline information, it refers to a 12 month period, which we call a reference year. Current year data from monitoring systems or seasonal assessments are compared to the baseline values to assess the degree to which hazards and shocks has reduced household access to food and income. And it is at this point where households respond to the shock, um, and this is also referred to as coping capacity. This includes, uh, so this is included in the analysis. Outcome analysis quantifies any food or cash deficits and offers the amount of food or cash needed to mitigate food and livelihood insecurity. At its inception, HEA was developed to measure and predict short-term changes to access to food. HEA focuses on how households make ends meet from one year to the next and the assets they, they rely on that enable them to do so. This includes how they survive or fail to survive throughout, uh, through difficult times. Understanding local livelihoods provides insight on how to appropriately address short-term food and livelihood security needs, as well as inform decision makers on whether or not medium or long-term interventions will support or undermine existing strategies. Next slide, please. <clears throat> The HEA analytical framework is divided into six steps shown here. The livelihood zoning is the first step in the process and is necessary before carrying out HEA baseline. The zoning disaggregates geographic areas according to distinct livelihood patterns. So in the case of Mali, the northern areas are often drier areas um, that are less conducive to agricultural production Therefore, household livelihoods in, in these areas are more dependent on uh, pastoralism or their livestock. And as you move further south, agricultural production becomes more prominent. The second step in the HEA framework is the wealth group breakdown, which is the grouping of people using local, not international, definitions of wealth, as well as the quantification of their assets. The third step is the quantification of livelihoods. And this is where access to food and cash income and expenditure patterns are quantified for households in each wealth group. Together, these three steps make up the baseline. And again, developing or updating baselines is the primary objective of this task order. Now you'll see the last three steps, problem specification, analysis of coping, and calculation of deficits. These three steps make up the outcome analysis, which is mainly done by our uh, early warning colleagues. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Um, so once our teams, I wanna briefly go over the process of how data was collected in Mali. So once the teams arrive to their assigned livelihood zone, they carry out a sequence of interviews. Each interview shown on this slide builds from the previous sets of information. So for example, circle level interviews, which verifies information from the livelihood zoning and mapping um, uh, is verified at this point, And we collect additional information on the on general patterns of livelihoods in each of the livelihood zones. Um, addition, after that, the team will then proceed to speak with community leaders. Information from the previous levels are cross-checked while more details are collected uh, about the village level production and seasonality. This is also the level where teams divide communities into different wealth categories and quantify their assets. The last level of inquiry, inquiry is the household representative level interview. Representatives from each wealth group is identified 
uh, each wealth group identified is interviewed and the sources of food income and expenditure are quantified for the 12 month reference period. Next slide, please. So why does FuseNet use HEA for its analyses? Well, the reasons can be shown here, and there are two. The first is technical, while the other is practical or operational. Let's explore both. Next slide, please. HEA informs humanitarian assistance by showing where households are most at risk of food insecurity, who within these geographies are most at risk of food insecurity, how the hazard or hazards have affected access to regular sources of food and cash income, and how expenditure patterns may have changed. Within the, within the year, access to food and income will be affected by hazards or a hazard. And we do all of this analysis by examining what you see here on the left. And on the right, the table shows where we will, where within the process, um, we will be collecting this information to inform the left. So quickly, um, you can just proceed clicking here until that next one there, stop. Um, <coughs> geographic stratification um, provides where acute food insecurity may take place. And we address this through the livelihood zoning. Not all households in a community are affected by hazards in the same way. Some households have access to more resources while others do not. Therefore, the degree to which hazards will affect access to uh, food and income will also be different. So in HEA, the second step of the framework, the wealth group breakdown, looks at the differences of wealth within the community. Understanding the production systems, marketing and exchange systems, entitlement systems, provide insight on how households access food and income. And then HEA, we captured this information in step three. In other words, the quantification of livelihood strategies. The analysis and incorporation of seasonal access, the modeling of outcomes of multiple hazards are done in the fourth, fifth, and sixth steps of the HEA framework. This falls under the outcome analysis. And then finally, HEA, when combined with the cost of diet, can provide a nutritional analysis as well. Next slide, please. Another reason that FuseNet uses HEA is a practical one. Because HEA has been used by a wide range of agencies for well over well, almost 25 years, there exists a large collective and shared database that FuseNet can draw. In addition, because HEA is well understood by many partners, it makes it easier to communicate about the analysis and increases the chances of building consensus and transparency. Next slide, please. Next slide. So before I go into the uh, data collection process in Mali, I want to provide a brief history of HEA in Mali. The updating and development of HEA baselines in Mali are part of a decades-long process of refining and improving the country's humanitarian and emergency response systems. So you can see from this graph, um, our work started uh, in 2003, and um, in this year, uh, in 2023, uh, there was the development of the HEA baselines for FuseNet's Pillar 3 test order. Next slide. So at the end of May of 2023, FuseNet's Pillar, One, uh, Pillar 3 um, launched activities in Mali with an orientation exercise in Bamako. During the workshop, the technical team provided an overview of the task order's objectives, the implementation plan, the field work protocol, um, the HEA analytical framework, and what the expected outputs would be. And there was a second day where participants met in small breakout groups to discuss implementing and imp implementation and technical challenges. Next slide. In June, FuseNet's Pillar 3 technical team coordinated with Save the Children Mali to co-implement data collection activities. 
Next slide. Also in June, the, the, the work in Mali started with a team leader training um, led by the Food Economy Group consultant Naum Sidibe for 16 leaders of the first round of field work and partner staff. The team leaders then led their own baseline trainings for their teams before starting the field work. Another baseline training was led by Sidibe um, in Bamako to replace team members who are not available for the second round, but I'll get into that. Next slide. From June to August, uh, the teams were mobilized to collect data across two rounds. Um, the, the, for round one, um, teams went to zone seven, eight, nine, 12, 13, and 16. And round two, teams mobilized to three, five, six, 10, 11, and 15. Also, um, a third baseline training was given to team members in the northern region of Gao, which had more difficult access and which we discovered that it would be beneficial for um, local team members to conduct the field work. Next slide. Round three was in ML4 and it took place in, a, in and around Gao City, ML2 and ML14 were paused due to the um, increased instances of insecurity that Phil mentioned in his opening remarks. Next slide. Um, in November, um, the technical team traveled to Mali to co-host the Validation of Results Conference, which was in Sakaso, Mali. Next slide. A total of 31 participants attended the validation conference. And this is where the technical team in conjunction with our SAP colleagues built consensus and validated the livelihood baseline profiles. A second smaller validation was carried out in the beginning of February in Bamako to present the tools um, and to close the activity. Next slide. And then in December, um, as Phil mentioned, our SAP colleagues, so this is the Malayan early warning team, um, they led teams to collect uh, the data in the remaining livelihood zones in the northern part of the country. Mm -hmm. And um, Nora and uh, the technical team backstopped this team um, throughout the, the process of data collection and analysis. Next slide, please. And now I would like to introduce the technical lead for this field work and our colleague, Nora Leckenberry. Over to you, Nora. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen, for that introduction. So the next section of this presentation is going to provide you with a summary of the overall results for this um, HA baseline assessment in Mali. If you have any questions throughout this section of the presentation, you're welcome to post them in the chat function, and we will have a Q&A session at the end where we'll aim to answer those questions um, moderated by our colleague, Angelina. So please feel free to post those. The, this section of the presentation follows a similar layout to the HA baseline report, which will be available very soon. And it will start with a few words on the national context for Mali and an overview of the livelihood zones. We will have um, a, a, some information on seasonality as a key component of this analysis, some information on the reference years that have been used for the data collection. We will look at the wealth breakdown, by which we mean the disaggregation into normally four groups, four wealth groups. After that, we shall have a look at the overall patterns um, for the different livelihood zones and the different wealth groups in terms of sources of food, sources of cash, and expenditure patterns. To end with this um, concept of total income, which is relevant to HEA, and I will point you towards the final products where you can find a lot more details on the different aspects that we're going to cover today in this presentation. 
So the baseline study covered 16 livelihood zones in Mali, and in doing so, it analyzed very diverse agroclimatic zones from the very dry Northern Sahara desert zone to progressively wetter, more fertile zones towards the, uh, the South, including the Sudanese and pre-Guinean agroclimatic agro zones. Overall, rural livelihoods in Mali are dominated by subsistence farming with herding, where the livestock component has a bigger weight in the north and as you progress south, there are varying degrees of food and cash crop production supported always by livestock. Um, access to remittances, to gold mining sites and to seasonal migratory labor also are important characteristics of some of these livelihood zones. Regrettably, the backdrop to livelihoods in Mali is one of insecurity and political instability and climate change, which are affecting um, livelihoods and food security. And indeed, the ongoing conflict in the north um, has been a recurrent feature of the baselines in that area. And as explained before, um, has impacted the work and we had to have a small pause before the teams could access the field again. The map, which we have seen briefly previously, the map on the slide presents the livelihood zones in Mali. There are 17 livelihood zones. The last one is an urban zone, which covers the capital city, Bamako, and some of the largest cities in Mali. The original map dates from 2003, and it has um, followed a number of iterative revisions in 2009, in 2013 again, uh, which have increased and decreased the number of zones. Um, at the end of the Pillar 3 Task Order 1, we have made some small adjustments to the map, but only to some zone boundaries. So the number of livelihood zones have remained the same. Um, all these processes have always been uh, carried out in, uh, together with the um, the National HEA Working Group, FUSENET colleagues, relevant ministries, NGOs and UN agencies operating in the country. And of course, the livelihood zones, which uh, were briefly explained the concept uh, by my colleague Stephen, a livelihood zone is a homogeneous zone in which um, Residents, households have similar options for their livelihoods, and they normally have the same um, climate, same topography, and a very similar access to market. The, the zones therefore provide the sampling frame in which the baseline work is carried out. Okay, seasonality is an important component of livelihoods and HA baselines and access to food and income and key expenditure are explored throughout a 12 month period. This information is synthesized in seasonal calendars, which are available for each of the livelihood zones and those are presented in the final report. Overall, the uh, seasonality is broadly similar throughout Mali um, and is determined by a single rainy season followed by an extended dry season. Um, in general, the rainy season starts about May and continues until the end of September. The more north you go, the later the start of the rainy season and also the lower the um, total rainfall for the, uh, for the year with as low as 200 millimeters per year of rainfall in the northern areas or even less in the Sahara Desert. The main cropping um, season is pegged to the timing of the rain, with land preparation activities starting just before the onset of the main rains um, around April, and with sowing and planting peaking in June and July, although that might start earlier in the in southern zones where the rainy season starts earlier. And overall, we have a main harvesting period which starts in October and can go through until the end of November for the entire country. Um, the, the importance of the rainy season is equally um, relevant for flood recession zones where the rainfall has an effect on the rising water levels of the Niger River and therefore the timing for flood recession crop production and, and agriculture. And equally, 
um, it is a key component of um, livestock rearing where the rainy season dictates the replenishment of the replenishment of grazing and browsing grounds which lead to better conditions for mating and equally starts uh, dictates the start of uh, milk production and milk availability for the household so let's look at an example of a seasonal calendar in this case for zone ml4 which is in the north of mali and here we can see information on the typical crops for that zone with uh, land preparation activities starting towards June and the main harvest being in October and slightly later for rice in November. We also have information on the different types of livestock which are raised in that particular livelihood zone differentiated by species. We have the information on peak conceptions, peak births and the peak milking uh, production season where households have access to milk, those households that own animals would have access to milk. But besides crops and livestock, these calendars also show um, in the seasonal information for other income sources, that might be labor, uh, and key expenditure periods, such as the lean season, where the dependence on the purchase of food would increase, and unfortunately is the moment where food prices peak as well. Um, seasonal information for typical human diseases where the expenditure on, on uh, medical um, visits and, um, in, uh, and, and medicines might increase. I will show you a second example um, of livelihood zone 5 in the Bandiagara circle, again in the northeast um, in Mopti. And here we can see similar patterns in terms of crop production, but we can see that there is an important second season, um, flood recession production of vegetables, but importantly, shallots, which are a key cash crop for this livelihood zone and can be grown over two, if not three cycles throughout the year after the main um, harvest period for the cereals. Okay, so in the HAA baseline assessments, data is collected for a very, very specific time period, and that is called the reference year. Typically, the reference year is the most recent consumption year, and the consumption year starts with the month when own household food production starts, whether that would be crop production or in, in um, pastoral areas, the start of the access to milk from the, their own animals. So for the majority of zones, the reference year starts in October, but in two zones which are considered pastoral, that is ML1 and ML2, covering Timbuktu, Kidal, Gao, and Menaka, the reference, the consumption year, and therefore the reference year starts in July. Now, the reference year is not the same in all baseline assessments because the objective is to select a year during which livelihood patterns reflect the typical situation in that zone. Now, rainfall is one of the key determinants of the outcome of the consumption year, but we cannot um, ignore the impact of insecurity and food, food uh, price hikes and sometimes even input price hikes, which might mean that we could have potentially two zones with a similar outcome in terms of rainfall, but where the reference year has been selected differently due to, unfortunately, insecurity in some of these areas. So the table here presents you the different reference years that have been used for the data collection. As far back as 2019-2020, in some of the zones and as recent as July 2022 to June 2023 in the one of the final um, baseline assessments that was conducted in Timbuktu for the pastoral zone ML1. Okay, um, the disaggregation by wealth, uh, sorry, HA baseline information is disaggregated by geography as we have just seen according to livelihood zones 
And in a second step, it's as my colleague Stephen showed you, it is uh, disaggregated by wealth into common wealth groups. And this is because people's access to food and income depends on where they live, but also on their wealth status and their um, asset holdings. Overall, in Mali, we see that the key determinants of wealth are the size of the land cultivated by households, except obviously in the purely pastoral zones, especially ML1 in the north and to a lesser, lesser extent in ML2, and also by the types and numbers of livestock, livestock owned by the household. Let's take a look at land first. Um, the amount of land cultivated by households varies across the zones and the wealth groups. This can depend on land availability. Uh, for example, in ML7, which is the office de, de, du Niger, um, inner Niger Delta region, where there is the production of rice through agricultural um, irrigated infrastructure. Here, the, the population pressure on irrigated land is high and access to that type of land is difficult, which determines the amount of land cultivated by different wealth groups. But more often than not, the capacity to cultivate land is determined um, by, the, by the household's capacity. So we tend to see that the middle and especially the better off cultivate more land because they have more able-bodied members uh, within their household. They also have more animals, including oxen, which they can use for plowing. And they also have the capital to hire additional laborers at key times of the agricultural season. Um, as a result, we see that very poor households cultivate the least amount of land. However, I must say that very, household, very poor households have access to arable land in all zones except ML01. So we have seen no instances of landlessness amongst very poor households. Households in the southern zones, uh, which are more, which are where the climate is wetter and they are more um, fertile, uh, cultivate more land, and households in the arid areas of the north cultivate the least amount of land. Let's take a look at that information in a quantitative form. Uh, this graph shows you the typical land area cultivated in hectares by households in each wealth group and each livelihood zone. And we can see that those zones ML10, 11 and 12, which are located in the south of the country, the um, area cultivated per household, especially amongst the better off, can be as high as nearly 25 acres, uh, sorry, hectares. Whereas in the northern arid zones, ML2, ML3, ML4, um, ML14 equally, the capacity of households to cultivate and obviously the um, local climate is not conducive. So households, um, land area cultivated is a lot smaller. And we can see that in ML1, um, there is no crop, crop production at all, and here households re rely on a variety of income generating um, activities, primary of which is livestock sales and trade. Here we have a similar graph, in this case by weighted average, that is including the percentage of households, the weight of the number of households per wealth group, and the picture it paints is relatively similar. Okay, if we now look at livestock, um, livestock is very closely associated with wealth. It's a significant source of income for households, especially middle and better off households across the country. But it's also an important way of saving and investing and a safeguard, therefore, for um, in bad years. The main types of livestock um, raised in Mali are cattle, sheep and goat goats. Camel ownership is limited to the north of the country, zones one and two and three. And there are other types of animals such as donkeys and horses and poultry, but their role in, in the local economy and the household economy is um, smaller. So um, looking at cattle uh, first, we can see that middle and better off households in every single livelihood zone own cattle 
whereas this is not the case for very poor and poor households. Um, zones two in the north, four and one of the um, cropping areas in the south of the country, ML12, have the largest cattle numbers per household. And it is zone ML16, which is predominantly characterized by um, gold mining and gold panning activities, have, has the lowest um, ownership of cattle. The next graph on the slide uh, shows you the typical number of cattle owned by households in each wealth group in each livelihood zone and reflects the information that I was showing you previously with evidently more, life, uh, more livestock in the north and a varying degree, but on the whole less in the cropping areas in the rest of the country. If we now look at goat and sheep ownership, um, these are a source of cash income for most households in most zones. They reproduce faster than cattle and they're less expensive to maintain. Therefore, uh, we see higher numbers being owned. Very poor households typically own at least one or two goats or sheep. They're so not, you know, very small amounts. Um, but the, the, these animals provide a key opportunity to generate some income in times of need. Um, poor households own larger herds, um, between five and ten goats or sheep, and generally not more than 15 small livestock, even in the livestock dominant zones. Overall, similar to cattle, the highest small stock ownership numbers are found in the north, in, zone, in the more pastoral dominant zones of ML1, ML2 and ML4. And once again, the lowest numbers are found in ML16, which is the gold um, zone. Similar to cattle, this graph presents the typical number of goats and sheep owned by households in each wealth group and each livelihood zone. And again, reflects the information that I had just said, shared in the previous slide. Okay. Next is the some quantitative information on the wealth breakdown. So this graph shows the percentage of households that fall, fall into each of the four wealth groups. And as explained previously, this is according to the community's own understanding of, of wealth disaggregation and not some nationally defined parameters. Over one third of households fall into the poor category in dark green on the graph. And uh, combined with those households falling in the very poor category in yellow, we see that these two wealth groups um, represent 50 to 60% of households across the 16 zones. The middle category in the light green is not too different in terms of weight as the poor and the better off uh, represent between 10 to 15% of households in each zone. Of course, there are households at both extremes of this wealth disaggregation. We have households which would be considered even more vulnerable than the very poor, and they may survive primarily thanks to social to local social support networks. And we may also have wealthier households um, with larger um, asset holdings than those that are presented here for the better off. Okay, so in order to um, conduct our baseline assessments, um, we conduct lengthy, lengthy interviews with household representatives from each wealth group. And we're talking three to four, if not five hours of um, questioning to understand the seasonality and to be able to quantify those main three pillars of information, um, sources of food, income and expenditure, in order to provide a quantified statement. Um, of these three types of information. We'll start by having a look at the overall um, patterns across the 16 livelihood zones and the four wealth groups um, in terms of sources of food. Just to get your bearings, more or less, um, and I think um, Chloe generously shared the livelihood zone map um, which you're, you're welcome to open at the same time as you listen to me um, because we're using the codes 
to make it simpler, but in terms of the geography, it's a little bit more difficult to find your bearings. So more or less zones ML1 to ML9 are located primarily in the north and the center north of the country, um, to which we add ML14, which is located in Nyahunke in the south of Timbuktu region. And more or less ML10 to ML16 are primarily located in the center and south of the country, which helps to understand the, the north-south patterns that we're going to see, uh, certainly in crop production. So these graphs present six main categories of um, sources of food. We have the production of, of crops by the household in dark green. We have the production or the access to milk and meat from their own herds. We have payment in kind in blue. We have purchase, so food purchases in orange, food aid in um, green and other um, in, in purple, which would include um, access to wild foods, to fishing and donations in, of food. So we can see that very starkly that there are two primary sources of food. We have own crops um, in green, as I said, and purchases in orange. We can see, first of all, that there is a um, north-south trend where southern zones, um, where there's more land cultivated and the uh, agroclimatology accompanies uh, crop production is more suitable to crop production. Therefore, the dependence on the on own crops cultivated by the household is higher, but we also see a quite stark difference between the um, wealth groups where the middle and the better off can rely more heavily on their own crop, on their own crops, um, given that they have, that they cultivate larger um, land sizes. Therefore, the opposite is true for the dependence on the purchase of food from the market, where the very poor are much more dependent um, on the market than the middle and the better off. It is important to note that all wealth groups analyzed across the 16 zones reach the international accepted benchmark of 2100 kilocalories per person per day, but in the in at least half of the livelihood zones, this was only possible thanks to the um, availability of food aid in the selected reference years for each of the livelihood zones. Um, and these are especially those zones in the north, um, north and center north of the country. And by food aid, generally what we were seeing, it was um, cereal distributions uh, by the um, government, the Mali government and its partners, uh, especially cereal distributions towards the end of the lean season or during the lean season. And in some uh, livelihood zones, this also includes access to school canteens, but that was by no means a general feature of all livelihood zones. The access to own milk and meat is uh, presented in red, and this is much, much more visible evidently in the zones in the north where the livestock component is bigger, it's larger, and especially across middle and better off households who tend to have more cattle, and especially if they have camel, uh, where the um, milk production is a lot, a lot higher. Some um, words on payment in kind. So payment in kind um, includes Payments for local agricultural labor, usually towards the harvest for, for harvesting and post-harvest activities. Um, but it also includes the food that is accessed during periods of migration where one or multiple household members, especially the, uh, the men, leave the household to search for labor elsewhere. And this has been categorized as payment in kind. And it's the reason why we see the blue bars are appearing um, in the middle of wealth group and even in the better off wealth group, not because they're paying, they're getting payments for the local labor in terms of cereals, but because they're, they have at least one, if not more, household members migrating for part of the year to look for work or trade um, outside of their home livelihood zone. 
here we have some um, easier to follow um, visual representations on these on the um, importance of different categories of um, food. So on the left, we have the percentage of annual food that is derived from crops. And here we see very clearly that there is a higher um, dependence on crops towards the south of the country. The graph presents the information um, for the weighted average. So taking into account the percentage of households in the four different wealth groups. The graph on the right um, presents the um, dependence on food purchases. And we can see that is the opposite, uh, the mirror opposite um, image with much higher dependency on the market in the north than in the south. Again, as a weighted average for the four wealth groups. Here we have um, the main food crop and the secondary food crop um, across the, the country. We can see that in the north um, is mainly sorghum and millet, um, supplemented by cowpeas, which is nearby. Um, in the south, there is much more reliance on maize, um, thanks to the to the climate. Uh, maize is possible. To be, it, it is possible to grow maize in the south of the country, supplemented by rain-fed rice and rain-fed millet. We have the exception in the graph on the left, that middle um, livelihood zone, which is the where the, we see the production of irrigated rice, and also in in the inner. Niger, Niger Delta, but also along the riverbanks um, in that small strip that follows the Niger River as it exits towards Niger, where rice is the main food crop product, uh, produced. Okay. If we turn our attention to the sources of cash in the reference year, Again, we're presenting by livelihood zone and by wealth group. We have six categories of um, activities. We have crop sales in dark uh, green. We have milk sales, again, in red. We have casual labor in blue, livestock sales in purple, self-employment activities in green and other, which could include um, the sale of wild foods, the sale of fish, if fishing is a dominant activity in the livelihood zone, and it also includes gifts in cash, typically the, the zakat. zakat. So um, first let's draw attention to the casual labour in, in pale blue, which is evident everywhere, but is most important for the very poor and poor households. We can see it um, in middle and better off in, uh, wealth groups because it includes local farming uh, labor, which might be related to crop production, and it uh, predominantly is, but in livestock dominant zones, it can also include herding labor. Local off farm labor, working in the cities, uh, working in the construction sector within the livelihood zone, but it also includes seasonal migration labor, which in which middle households and better off households take part. And it includes remittances, whether that's remittances from family members within the country or family members located abroad. Okay, in terms of um, sales of crops in dark green, we see that it is predominantly an activity that middle and better off households can partake in because they have larger amounts of land and they typically also benefit from better access to um, intermediaries and to market, better access to inputs, um, which allow them to diversify the crops and produce a lot more for sale. Um, we see that it is zones 10, 11, and 12, which are located in the south of the country, where the um, percentage of annual income derived from crop sales is the largest. And we can add ML7, 
which is that central zone in the Office uh, du Niger in um, irrigated rice area. If we turn our attention to the income generated from livestock, we can see that it is very important in the in zones three, four, and thirteen. Uh, sorry, and and one and two, uh, where livestock sales are more important, and evidently, thanks to their uh, larger herd sizes, middle and better off households are obviously going to be able to sell more animals than very poor and poor households. Having said that. Um, animals will only be sold when needed um, and they will be kept to um, safeguard against a bad year. Okay, in terms of self-employment, um, self-employment includes trade um, and petty trade, um, selling of bush products, primarily firewood, but also grasses and fodder, wild foods, um, it also includes the production and sale of bricks and a variety of handicrafts, depending on the livelihood zone. And apologies, self-employment also includes um, the gold panning, which is uh, extremely important in ML16, which is why we see that very large green bars for um, all four wealth groups in ML16. Okay, if we take a, um, a look at the map, that shows the percentage of uh, annual income derived from crop sales. We see that this is more important in the south of the country, um, where, and especially in zone 12 and, excuse me, uh, 11, where there is a variety of cash crops, uh, including cotton, uh, which historically has been one of the dominant cash crops in Mali, but also fruits, a variety of fruits, um, groundnuts, and to a lesser extent, maize. Here we have two um, maps which show the main crop sold per livelihood zone. Um, in the north, we have cereals, uh, predominantly sorghum and millet which are sold. Um, in the south, we have maize supplemented by rice. Sorry. Let's try that again. Uh, in terms of income, um, in the north we have, um, in, in the, especially in that, that green area, of Gao and Timbuktu and Menaka, we have vegetables that are the main crops sold, and this is thanks to seasonal pools where vegetables can be produced in an otherwise very arid area. Towards the center north, we have a reliance on um, rice, both irrigated rice in that ML7 zone in the center of the country, but and rainfed rice um, in the, in the um, border zones in the in the long. ML4 and ML13 um, zone, excuse me. Groundnuts are the main crop, crop sold in the center of the country. And in the south, uh, we have cotton and fruits, which are the main crop sold or the secondary crop sold. Okay, the next graph presents us um, the percentage of income from livestock, and as we have said before, this is much more important in the livestock dominant areas in the north, but is evident throughout the all wealth groups and all livelihood zones um, to a lesser, greater or lesser extent. If we have a look at the maps which present the percentage of income from labor, we can see that this is most, um, sorry, the map on the left presents the information only for the very poor and poor groups, which derive a bigger percentage of their annual income from labor. And we see that that is very important in the north um, of Mali and less so, progressively less so towards the south, with those three very small areas um, which have a higher 
in the south of Mali in, with a very um, light blue shaded color, which have a higher dependency on, on crop production. If we now look at the map on the right, which presents the percentage of annual income from self-employment, we see that this is evident um, throughout the country, but most important in the southern zones, so southwestern zones, where we have categorized as self-employment the gold panning activities related to um, gold mining. So these have been labeled as self-employment rather than labor because it's the households themselves that um, work, work for themselves uh, looking for the gold and then sell them on to intermediaries rather than working for somebody else. And we have the areas close by um, the around the gold mining sites where where the households can also take part in those gold mining activities. Okay, so up to there we have seen um, the relative weight of income sources. And now let's have a very short look at the absolute value of annual household income. Here we have two graphs. The top graph in, in the two greens shows the cash, the annual cash income in, in West African francs per year for the very poor and the better off in order to see the disparities. And the graph on the bottom in two shades of blue shows the annual cash income per person per year. Let's look at the top graph first to show you um, the baseline assessment results show that uh, annual household incomes are the highest in zone ML12, where households grow a variety of cash crops. They have cotton, they have fruits, they have groundnuts and some maize as well that are sold as well as gold panning related activities. Um, we also have high annual incomes in zone seven, which is the irrigated rice um, zone, and in zone eight, which is the zone in the, north, in the west, um, which is highly dependent on remittances. The lowest um, total income zones are ML9, ML6, and ML13, which are more of a, let's say, subsistence zones without any particular cash crops that uh, provide a higher uh, amount of income. We can see th uh, that there's a um, stark difference between the, the top and the bottom graphs, whereby the difference in income at a household level is um, very large between the very poor at one so at, at one end of the wealth spectrum and the better off at the other end. Whereas if we look at the cash income per person, the, the difference is, is lower. Let's take an example of zone seven, where the cash income per household is nearly seven times greater between the very poor and the better off, but only twice as high um, in terms of per cap on a per capita basis. Another interesting example is ML1, where we see that uh, our, on a per capita basis, the total annual income becomes the highest in the whole country. And this is um, just explained by the fact that average household sizes in zone one, which is the pastoral zone in the very far north, covering Timbuktu and Kidal, are much smaller with an average of about 10 people, 10 household members, Whereas for the um, remaining, for the other livelihood zones in the country, the better off have an average of 18 to even 30 household members um, per family, which skews the results um, considerably. Okay, let's move on to the expenditure patterns. Um, once again, by livelihood zone and by wealth group, we have seven, eight, um, expenditure categories. In yellow we have staple food which is mainly the, the cereals that are consumed in that particular livelihood zone, non-staple food which includes oil, sugar, small amounts of fish, dried fish, 
typically, and small amounts of um, meat and pulses. We have household items, which include soap, um, grinding costs, um, and small the, 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 the cost of, of replacing um, crockery and uh, cooking equipment. Um, sometimes in the middle and the better off, household items might include the purchase of firewood, but this is not at all, uh, this is not a common feature um, for many livelihood zones. In black, um, expenditure on water, which typically is not um, directly the, pur the purchase of water, but a better contribution to the uh, maintenance of the community pumps and boreholes. In orange, we have inputs, and these are both investment into agricultural inputs and livestock inputs, um, where the heaviest component is usually the hiring of, of additional labor at the specific moment in the calendar. In blue, we have social services, which include education and health. In aligned purple and white, we have expenditure on clothes. And the final category in purple is other, which is uh, a combination of discretionary items, um, including transport, communication, but also celebrations, festivals, um, cash donations, and um, less important, less um, essential items that might be purchased throughout the year. So as expected, very poor and poor households spend a larger proportion of their annual income on staple food and non-staple food. And strikingly, it reaches up to 70%, if not more, of annual incomes for the very poor and poor in zone one, where there is no crop, crop production at all. The opposite is true for middle and better off households, which as a percentage, even though they have a larger amount of uh, mouths to feed, as a percentage of the total annual expenditure, um, the percentage res uh, reserved for food um, purchases is lower. All households spend some of their annual income on household items. Um, and this varies across the wealth groups um, and livelihood zones. Obviously, it increases in absolute terms, but in relative terms, the, the patterns throughout the, the wealth groups are not so stark. Um, on the contrary, the amounts of um, ex annual expenditure devoted to productive inputs are much more dominant and, and larger in the middle and the better off wealth groups. especially in those areas where um, cash crops are produced uh, predominantly cotton, which requires a higher amount of inputs uh, than cereals, for example. If we look at expenditure on social services, once again, in terms of absolute values, there is a clear increase um, across the wealth group, but in relative values, this is less evident. And as you go up the wealth spectrum, overall, the percentage of cash that is available for discretionary spending, these um, less essential items, uh, becomes greater, which in the end means that they have a greater buffer, economic buffer, in time um, when confronted to, to hazards in a bad year. And this is very clear uh, in these graphs, how the purple um, bars are much larger in the middle and the better off groups. Okay, so up to there, um, we have looked at individually at the sources of food and the sources of income, but um, HEA uses this concept of total income, food and cash to present the information um, in a combined way uh, by adding up the the value of the food produced plus the cash earned and in the in in a way this is a much more complete representation of the real income rather than looking at the cash income alone when this total income food plus cash information is used together with the livelihood protection threshold and the livelihood protection threshold is the cost of um, covering the 
of supporting livelihoods for a year, covering the food that is required, covering the um, inputs that are required to produce, to, to carry out those main economic activities in the livelihood, combined, these are, this um, is quantified as the livelihood protection threshold. And when we, when we analyze together the total income with the livelihood protection threshold, this gives us a measure of the resilience um, and the livelihood security of different wealth groups across the livelihood zones. I'll just say that the total income can be presented in cash terms or in food terms. And we'll just have a look at a graph that presents the total income in uh, cash terms, once again in the West African franc. Um, and here we have the weighted average for each livelihood zone. And we can see that households in zone ML8, which is the remittance dominant zone in the west of the country have the highest total income in that particular reference year while those in ml9 which is located in the center of the country have this smallest the, the lowest total income for that particular reference year okay so we have covered some of the information uh, from the baseline analysis uh, for the baseline assessment, but you can find much, much, many more details in a number of products that will be available very shortly through the FuseNet website. And these include the Livelihood Zone Baseline Profiles Report, which include detailed descriptions of the livelihoods for each of the 16 zones covered. These descriptive reports are accompanied by the databases, the Excel-based um, spreadsheets, which include all the primary data and the um, consolidated results for each and every one of the variables across the four wealth groups. There is also some um, analysis tools which have been prepared for Mali with the new data, the first of which is the Livelihood Impact Analysis Spreadsheet, or LIAS, and this is a tool that um, allows the development of projections for early warning, for resilience modeling, um, for project selection, and a number of other uses, um, some of which my colleague Stephen is going to present um, after me. A second uh, analysis tool which has been developed with the new baseline data is the dashboard, which is a more user-friendly regional outcome analysis tool for larger scale analysis. And as well as those products, we have um, one pager fact sheets for each of the livelihood zones, which pull out the key information in terms of the location of the zone, the seasonal calendar, the um, assets um, by, by wealth group and the food income, uh, access to food, income and expenditure graphs pulled out from the, um, from the reports. And we have a selection of attributes maps, some of which we have seen in the presentation today. Okay, I don't know how we did for time, <laughs> but um, I welcome you to share the questions. Angelina, perhaps you can take us through some of those if there have been any questions, and I will do my best to try and answer them. Thank you. Question. Should I go live? Yep. Thank you so much, Nora. That was quite an extensive overview, a lot of information and good insights, good summary uh, observations. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned going back to sources of cash. I believe you mentioned Zadaka yes. in passing. Yes. yes. Uh, a voluntary form of uh, giving uh, alms, if you will, alms to the poor. Mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, Ramadan. Ramadan started a, a few days ago. Previous research shows that gift giving or sadaqa increases during Ramadan. I'm just wondering if, if your sources of inf information disaggregated or identified sadaqa as a source of income. Mm -hmm. First question. If so, did you notice any differences, significant differences, among different livelihood zones mm -hmm. in, in Sadaka. Thank you. 
Thank you. Yes, and Ramadan Mubarak to our colleagues that are listening from, from Mali. Um, so we have quantified that information on the res receiving zakat um, in cash, also in kind, um, as um, gifts of food, which are generally not, not always zakat because they can be also at the, at the height of the lean season. Poor households might receive gifts of food from, from family and neighbors. Um, but in terms of zakat, it's been recorded separately. Um, and certainly we can see that it's the very poor and the poor households that are receiving and the middle and the better off that are, that are giving. Um, we haven't done a specific comparison livelihoods by livelihood zone, but this is something that could be done if it's of particular interest to any of our listeners. Yes. Thank you. We don't see any other question in the chat. Um, if someone uh, watching us live would like to make other questions, this is the moment to do so. And if not, we will continue with Stephen. Also, if there are any more questions, if you think of anything, oh, Michael, do you have your hand raised? Please proceed. Yeah. Michael, um, if you would like to come off of mute, go ahead. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> um, I was wondering about any analysis of uh, uh, household savings, uh, especially in the the more the well-off areas. Were you able to do that? Thank you, Michael. So we haven't specifically addressed savings. First of all, because in general, we're doing the, the data collection in um, focus group discussions. So unless a source of income in this case um, is typical for the majority of households in that, in that specific wealth group, it would not be recorded. Um, however, the hypothesis would be that the, in that um, purple section that we saw within the expenditure graphs, um, which had non-essential expenditure, a part of that could be savings. That would be the hypothesis that they are not spending, especially in middle and better off wealth groups, they're not spending the annual expenditures, not matching the annual income, and therefore the surplus could be considered as savings. However, I will go further and say that typically what we see is that if there is save, if there are savings, those can also be reflected in the purchase of animals. So we do have a line that looks at um, income spend uh, expenditure on um, life animals, which is often representative of a savings. So that's something, again, that could be looked at individually. But we haven't recorded um, cash savings per se. Yeah, thank you. I was um, thinking that the animals, mm -hmm. I agree with you, that would be a way of measuring this savings yeah thank you yes and we do see purchases of animals on an annual basis but not in every livelihood zone per second and amongst the better usually the middle more frequently the better off also let's sorry the last point there let's not forget that the reference year um, is an example of an average year not a very good one but not a very poor one so purchases of animals could be evident. In a poor year, that, that won't be the case, obviously. And in a better year, in a very good year, that might increase. But the reference year does not reflect a very good year where savings and purchases of animals would increase or would be more evident. Thank you. Great, thank you, Nora, and thank you for your question. Um, John, you have your hand up, please proceed. Yes, thank you. A uh, very interesting uh, presentation and use of data. I was wondering if you do any correlation to households that have access to electricity or like PAYGO, elect solar home systems or anything like that, that is an impact at all on household income or, or productivity or anything else like that. Okay, um, so, the 
access to electricity is discussed within the asset holding. So in the presentation today, we, we predominantly looked at um, land and livestock, but in the profile reports, if you want to delve into them, there is information on how um, households access electricity and if they own solar panels or if they only use um, handheld torches, for example. So there's some quantitative information on that. Uh, there is also some quantitative information on expenditure on electricity. Um, but there is no analysis in the correlation that that might have in terms of productivity. Um, obviously, the hypothesis is that it, that it would, um, but there's we haven't undergone that analysis, but there is some quantitative information in terms of um, the ownership or, or how people, households access electricity and if they spend, how much money do they spend um, in accessing electricity. Right. Good. Okay. Thank you. That was really, really helpful. It, it just begs more. <laughs> I laugh. More questions about the access to the information and the early warning systems around climate issues, and how much do women, are women in the front line of that information access? Mm -hmm. And are you seeing? Are you able to do a, a gender disaggregation? on women accessing the information? Um, so the gender disaggregation in Mali has been quite limited. We haven't disaggregated um, by gender in terms of, um, not the, we have some information on gender disaggregation in terms of labor activities, um, but we haven't quantified sources of food or income or expenditure according to gender. Um, in our in our baseline work in northern Nigeria, we had a fifth wealth group, which was the poor wealth group um, headed by female heads of households. Um, so there we have a little bit more quantified information um, along the gender lines. We had aimed to do the same in Mali, but the results um, from our study actually indicate that the vast majority of um, females who become heads of household uh, incorporated into existing households. So if, um, if a woman loses her husband, she obviously she most often would go and live um, with a family member of her husband's family, the next, um, the, um, the eldest son, uh, sorry, the eldest brother or, or somebody else in the family. So it was very difficult for our team to find household representatives from these um, female headed households with which to have conversations. Um, so that's been a small limitation of the analysis in Mali. And, you know, just to, to add on to that, um, we typically don't do gender disaggregations within HEA because the origins of HEA is to inform uh, decision makers on the amounts of food or income that is going to be distributed uh, for humanitarian purposes. And this, at least from my understanding, it, uh, humanitarian assistance is still provided by household um, and not necessarily by, by gender. Over. Thank you, Stephen. Okay. Um, if there are any lingering questions, um, please feel free to email me or Nora or Angelina, and we'll be happy to address any of those questions as they may arise. Um, I'm gonna take this moment now to briefly go over some of the other uses of the HEA baselines. Um, so I think a lot of the questions related to uh, uses of electricity, um, uh, you know, these are the different types of analyses that one could do um, uh, with the baseline information, but it does fall outside of our, our, our mandate. So next slide, please. Okay, so um, the, here is a sample of other applications of HEA that falls outside of the early warning context. You have your IPC and CH analyses. Um, 
HDA has been used to uh, identify resilient support interventions, um, inform casual labor monitoring systems, um, to support cash transfer programs, um, and to be included in the global dashboard for hotspot identification, which is a an early warning team um, tool, which I can go on a little bit later. Um, um, and also, it has been used to support program development and monitoring. Of course, there are probably other uses that fall outside of these, but given the amount of time that we have, um, I just want to go over just a few. Next slide, please. So the uses of HEA, um, the outcome analysis results um, are presented in either a livelihoods protection deficit or a survival deficit. And these outcomes serve as one of the five acute food uh, security indicators. And it is the only one out of the five that can project food security outcomes into the future. Next slide, please. Um, HEA also has uh, uh, the predictive capacity for, of HEA, which is used for early warning, can also be used to identify which interventions can support um, resilience. So basically the same predictive capacity uh, within HEA can be used to model a positive impact rather than a negative impact. And these can be used for um, the planning of development interventions. The slide here is an example from the Kenya Financial Tr Sector Deepening Trust, or FSD. And this particular project was, um, was, to, was designed to graduate people that are on the safety nets program in Northern Kenya and to model which of the interventions that were proposed could result in getting populations or households off the safety nets program. Um, this wasn't just the use of the baselines. The team had to um, develop um, income generating business plans. And then what they would, what we did here was then model the effect of each of these interventions across a five-year implementation period. But knowing that this area, which was in Marsabit, Kenya, and I don't know how many people on the car call are aware of Marsabit, Kenya, but this place is drought prone. So one of the things that we did was we included a moderate drought within the project period to then determine which of the interventions would perform well, even in the face of a drought. So out of all of the ones that were pro proposed, I believe like only three of the IGAs out of the, out of the, the seven were actually capable of, of graduating populations, even when there was a drought. So this is just a really neat way that HEA can be used to model the impacts of um, proposed interventions. Next slide, please. Um, <coughs> the majority, as we know from doing this work over the past couple decades, the majority of poor households really depend on casual labor as a primary source of income. The issue is that there aren't very many monitoring systems out there that capture casual labor. But with our HEA baselines and what our colleagues on the early warning team are doing is that they are using the baseline information to determine who does what and where for how long um, and what the importance is of casual labor uh, for each of the different households. And with this information, they're able to prioritize where to monitor different casual labor markets within a particular geography or within a country and then to set up systems to start tracking um, uh, mon uh, casual labor. Next slide, please. 
So HEA has been used to support cash transfer programming as well. So once the, the, the baselines um, are complete, they provide detail on how households spend their cash during the reference year. This understanding supports the sel uh, a selection of essential components that fall within a minimum expenditure basket. And it helps determine the cash amounts that are needed uh, to program multi-purpose cash transfers. Now, I should note here that developing a minimum expenditure basket is an additional step beyond the baseline development, but it is one of the things that can be done um, once the baselines have been completed. Next slide, please. Um, another use of the HEA outcome analysis um, is to model specific changes to household food and cash income. Um, and this results in a reliable estimate of the cash needs uh, given a specific hazard like a drought. Um, the modeling can be based on a current situation using recent needs assessments or a projected situation uh, that uses available forecasts. So combined with the seasonal analysis and price projections, an accurate monthly transfer amount can be planned throughout the year. Um, the, the set of graphs you see here on this slide um, <clears throat> provide the total income in both cash and food combined as expressed as cash and for poor households in the area of Sindh province pakistan in the reference year and in a hazard year so the lower graphs show that households will experience this deficit from may through october and a monthly cash transfer around 1500 or 1600 rupees is required in order to fill the gap for at least six months. Next slide, please. So this is the global dashboard for hotspot identification. This is a FuseNet Pillar 1 tool that was developed a couple years ago. And right now, the, um, the current pilot was completed for the Horn of Africa. Um, but there are, there are whispers that this may be um, extended to West African uh, countries. So as, as many baseline, uh, national baselines are available, they can be incorporated into a system like this. And what this, what this, <coughs> excuse me. So <coughs> FuseNet partners with science teams from um, the United States Geological Survey, NASA, and University of California, Santa, Santa Barbara, and they developed this livelihoods-based forecasting tool, which integrates the HEA baselines with remote sensing and the Food Economy Group Herd Dynamics Modeling Tool, plus FuseNet Pillar 1's price um, uh, market price modeling. And it is used to flag areas of concern, which then teams can be mobilized to do a more in-depth in -depth analysis. So this analysis tool manages a lot of very complex analyses and it's done on a monthly basis. So it's, it's a really neat tool. Um, if you need any more information, I encourage you to reach out to our early warning colleagues. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Um, here we have uh, how HEA has been used to support the development of certain types of projects. Um, so scenario analysis um, through the HEA outcome analysis was done in, in a USAID funded project called uh, Colombia Responde. And it answered different types of questions and which income options will households in different livelihood zones um, yield the most rewards and which hazards will put developmental gains at risk. So this information was used by um, then CHF, or I think they're now called Global Communities, to design appropriate programs and to establish systems for monitoring project outcomes. Next slide. Okay, so that is it right now. Um, before I go into some closing remarks, um, are there any questions at all at this point? Okay. Um, all right. So 
At this point, um, I'm just going to have a few closing remarks, um, and then we can shut the um, the workshop down. Um, so next slide. I, I would like to acknowledge all of the partners that we have worked with in in Mali throughout this exercise. Um, on behalf of the whole team, we are humbled and grateful for everyone that participated in this activity and this trickles down to the people that we spent hours with um, trying to glean this type of information from. So that includes um, the local government and NGO staff, the market traders, the community leaders, um, and the household representative them, them household representatives themselves. Um, without this information, um, our research would be, it would have been impossible. We also wanted to express our deepest gratitude to our implementing partners, Save the Children in Mali, and especially our colleagues um, at the National Early Warning System in Mali, um, the SAP. Their, their understanding of the Malayan context um, and their ability to navigate very, very complex um, logistics and field work allowed this research to move forward, especially in, um, in some of the more difficult times um, of the research. Um, I would like to uh, thank our colleagues, um, Mamadou Diara, who is our operations and logistics uh, associate um, within, um, within Mali, and he was based in the FuseNet Pillar 1 um, uh, office. And I would like to uh, really express our deepest gratitude to Adama Terra and Adama Dagnyoko and everyone on the FuseNet Pillar 1 team um, their, their guidance um, and their shepherding of this process would have not have been realized if it was not for them. Um, as Phil mentioned, um, we, we had a lot of, uh, of, of implementation issues, and if it wasn't for our, our colleagues and the Pillar 1 side, um, we would never have been able to navigate these issues um, in a way that would allow us to, to complete the work at a reasonable time. Their pearls of wisdom were just completely invaluable. Um, I would also like to thank um, our USAID core, Phil Steffen, and alternate core, Kirsten Johnson, for their support, their guidance um, throughout our implementation during the base year, and also their patience. And then lastly, I would like to express my our deepest gratitude uh, for the Pillar 1, or sorry, Pillar 3 Task Order 1 technical team, um, including Nora and everyone at FEG and all the consultants that took part in this work for their perseverance, patience, and flexibility. Um, I, and also our PMU colleagues to kind of shepherd us through some of the more contracting um, hurdles that we had to contract or uh, uh, go through early on. So with that, um, thank you to everyone that, ha that uh, took the time to join us um, through this presentation. We hope you found it useful. Um, these products, once they are finalized, will be available um, on the FuseNet website. Um, and if you have any additional questions or comments, feel free to reach out to me or anyone on the team and we'll be happy to point you in the right direction. That's it for us. Thanks, everyone.